everyone. I'm Hans Engel from the Directors Guild of Canada. Welcome to our 19th episode of DGC Masterclass via Zoom. These are unprecedented times beyond anyone's imagining, which makes me even more grateful that you are joining us tonight. With these masterclasses, we're going behind the scenes and talking to some of the top creatives in the industry in Canada and internationally, covering directors, designers, picture and sound editors with a new episode or two every week. You'll receive a new invitation with a specific link to tune in, and I'm also posting the links on my Instagram. So far, we've had Emmy-winning director Jean-Marc Vallée, Emmy-winning editor Kelly Dixon, Oscar-winning designers David and Sandy Wasco, a special event with brilliant Indigenous filmmaker Jeff Barnaby, two-time Oscar-nominated doc filmmaker Faraz Fayad, two-time Oscar-winning sound editor Karen Baker-Landers, Oscar and Palme d'Or nominee Adam Agoyan, Oscar-nominated designers K.K. Baird and Patrice Vermet, Maverick filmmaker Bruce McDonald, Oscar-nominated director, writer, producer, and actor Sarah Pauly, groundbreaking director Clement Virgo in conversation with Cameron Bailey, history-making 2019 Academy Award-winning production designer Hannah Beekler, prolific director and actor Helen Shaver, Oscar-winning legendary Star Wars picture editor Paul Hirsch, award-winning groundbreaking director Mina Shum, renowned director, writer, and actor Casey Lemons, and a special edition celebrating the release of Christian Spark's sophomore film, Hammer. All those can be found on the DGC National and DGC Ontario YouTube channels. Tonight, I'm very pleased to introduce our moderator. He's a production designer who has been in the film industry for over 20 years. He's designed projects for renowned directors such as David Cronenberg, George Romero, Deepa Mehta, Richard Donner, and Mary Heron. He's worked on eclectic films such as The Ever Great, Lars and the Real Girl, Jennifer's Body, Resident Evil Afterlife in 3D, No Escape, Brandon Cronenberg's Antiviral, and the war movie Hyena Road, directed by Paul Gross. He worked on Waco for the Paramount Channel, Genius Picasso for Fox Television and National Geographic, and Alias Grace for CBC Netflix. He's also designed pilot episodes of television series such as ABC's Lucky Seven and NBC's Timeless, among others. He's been nominated for two Genie Awards, five DGC Awards, and two Canadian Screen Awards. In 2003, he won a DGC Award for Cronenberg's Spider. More recently, in 2018, he won a Canadian Screen Award for Sarah Pauly's Alias Grace. Welcome the ever great Arv Greywall. <laughs> All right, hi there. Hello, everybody. Welcome. Welcome, Arv. Great to have you here. Thank you. Now at this point, I would typically read the bio for tonight's world-renowned guest, but he had a better idea. Let's watch it. Thank you. 
Amazing. Please welcome world-renowned production designer, Claude Paré. <laughs> there he is. Hi. Can you hear me? We can yes, hear you. Yes, absolutely. Welcome. Right. Okay. Hi. Now, before I turn it over to Arv and Claude, I'd like to point out to our viewers the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Please type your questions into that box. Uh, throughout the conversation tonight. Arv will be watching that and he'll try to get to as many of those questions as he possibly can. He may not get to all of them, but he will try. Uh, that's it for me. Arv and Claude, really looking forward to this conversation. Uh, see you at the end. Have a great Thanks, one. Brian. Thanks, man. Thank you so much. All right. Welcome, everybody. Welcome, Claude. Really amazing to uh, see your work. And uh, I just have to say, in terms of uh, the way we're doing it tonight, it's been amazing. Claude very graciously offered up uh, his reel and his work for us, his portfolio for us to have a look at. And uh, I sent out an email to the art department and the response was unbelievable. There are a ton of questions, but I encourage you guys to send more as we're speaking. That'll be fine. I'll figure it out how we can flip this, uh, slot them all in. Uh, and we're going to discuss basically five sets today. And if there's time, we'll do more. But I'm just going to run through the sets for a moment. It'll be the cistern set in it the Rialto Bridge set, uh, Jean's father's neighborhood, and the exterior of the, and the interior of the Neubolt house, and the two jets, uh, the X-Jet from X-Men and the Stark Jet from Spider-Man. So it's in fact seven sets we're gonna discuss, but uh, there's a lot more coming up. So let's get right to it. Uh, in the cistern set, Claude, I'm gonna start off with a question that sort of applies to a whole bunch of sets that you have uh, you can talk about, but it, specifically in terms of translating from script to screenplay, uh, in particular, giving thought to the action sequences, how do you kind of envision that design in your mind first and then get it out there uh, on paper or in model form? And do you speak in depth with the director, their vision for the action sequence, the stunt persons, and then uh, once the set is designed, do you work with the blocking of it all? So I'm just going to give it all to you. And now you can speak for about an hour, I suspect. <laughs> you know me. No, uh, seriously, uh, it's uh, from, from the page to the, to, the, to the actual set and the shooting day. I mean, there's a, there's a whole process that I don't handle all by myself. There's a whole crew. And I pay tribute to all the crews that I've worked with in the past because they really up my game and challenge me in a way that that I would have never imagined before uh, when I started in this business and that they are key to uh, to us I mean it's like it's without a crew you're nobody mm -hmm. so uh, yeah I mean when I get the, the script I read the script I go through the stuff and uh, and I I, I I see it and I, I don't know I have I have this this capacity of, of visualizing stuff in my mind most of the time at night, like around four o'clock in the morning, and and uh, and then and then I get into uh, into trying to uh, convey it, and it's like you know I do sketches, I do thumbnails now, but in the old days I did like giant charcoal drawings and so on, and uh, but now it's so you know technical and everything, so I do thumbnails, and then I pass it on to the art department, to the illustrators, and we present it to the director, and it's all it's it's an exchange, you know, it's like. And I meet with the director every morning that as, as I could, because I think it's crucial to create a relationship with the design, with the, the director and, and, and to, to, to establish a relationship of confidence, of trust and, and of creativity. And sometimes you work with a director, you'd be surprised how quickly they are with a pencil when you give it to them, you know? So it's like, I had a good time doing that, you know, like sketching and challenging each other's and everything. Right. But, I'm really happy that you mentioned confidence. I'm just going to break it down a little bit. We'll sort of get into sort of breaking all of it down because that level of confidence. So you've got the job and the director and now you're designing sets for the director. And, but you, you still haven't won over their confidence. They're probably still a little wary of, you know, the person that they've hired they're, You're new to them. They're new to you. I think that level of confidence that you build with the director 
has a lot of cachet as you move throughout the whole show. Yeah, I always say that after the phone call, it's downhill. First of all, you got the <laughs> price they offer you, and then you accept the job and you go on it, and then you have to prove yourself. You have to deliver, mm -hmm. and the pressure, the burden of delivering, is on your shoulder, shoulders. And 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 no matter what, no matter what people you have around you, you still have to convince the people that you've hired that you're good for the job. So you have to deliver that. So. I'm now going to switch the uh, uh, screen sharing and partager uh, l'écran. By the way, people who speak French, là en bas, c'est à droite, c'est questions et réponses, c'est Q and R, Q, Q et R pour les réponses. Alors, uh, so this is my screen. Do you see my screen right now? Yes, we do. Okay, so uh, we've seen the real uh, already. So I'm gonna, I'm just gonna. We start with it. Uh, yeah, the. Uh, Okay, so I'm going to show you a little, I, I've done lots of time-lapse uh, clips uh, throughout time, and I think it's, I think it's a good tool for, for tutoring, but also for, for showing the directors how, how, what the process is, because sometimes they don't figure it out. So this is stage two, I believe, at, uh, at the Pinewood in Toronto. Is it stage two? Anyway, so uh, I, had a great, I had a great time working with uh, John McKenzie and Cam Brooks. And, and his brother, and, uh, and they built this amazing set for us. So I'm gonna go really fast here. So we built that floor, that's for the cistern, and for those who have seen it, and then we started building also the tunnels. And then you see that we've built the roofing of the cistern first at the back there, because it was a very complicated, intricate structure. And then we, we, we actually raised it so that we could build the walls under it. So it was mechanically raised like this. Beautiful. And then we kept building the tunnels. So now I'm gonna to go to my website and I'm gonna show you uh, what this uh, thing is. It's the cistern. By the way, my website here is for those that have had access to it, uh, and some of you I know had, uh, is my permanent exhibition. This is like, this is like someone who wants to hire me. I give him the website, the, the access and the, uh, and the password and, and they go and they can see everything I've done in the last 20 years, roughly. So this is like imaging that I, 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 I do take from, from, from the pictures. So that's why those images are sensitive. Uh, we see, I mean, by the way, this cistern set was very much to me Chaplin-esque in the sense of, uh, you know, like, uh, um, uh, what was it called, uh, machines? Uh, the modern times. Modern times, thank you, Art. Uh, thank God we had a pre-meeting, but anyway, so <laughs> modern times, yeah. So it's, it's like this little girl and she's caught in this hell place and, and it's where Pennywise lives, for those who are familiar with the story. And, and we built that, as I showed you on stage, and, and you can see that all the patina and the water, for me, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna be really hectic, I'm just follow me. So for me, the floor is probably the most important part of a set, just so you know, it makes it believable or not. So in this case, I bought, I, 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 I asked for the, the, the guys to build some ponds by building little borders so that we could keep the water in certain places. And we established those and I drew them on the plywood so we could cut into the plywood. And then uh, we, we, I, 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 I've watched, uh, I actually, no, I didn't watch. I scouted uh, an amusement park in New Orleans for Percy Jackson and that place had been, had been flooded by Katrina. And I noticed that there was a, a line of, of white, uh, uh, um, how do you call it? phosphate marks. Yeah, like an efflorescence. Uh, uh, yeah, exactly. Like, like a, a water level that was just there permanently, but everywhere, everywhere, inside, outside, everywhere. It was like flooded all over. So water ran everywhere. So I decided to actually use this idea and make some phosphate marks on the walls, on the set dressing. You can see them very clearly here. And around the door and the locking system, I took that idea when I was driving uh, on uh, Don Valley in Toronto, which is 
also actually called uh, called Don Parkway in in, 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 in Toronto with uh, Randy Morgan looking for locations. And I was following a truck that, you know, sucks the shit out of Fort Hall or whatever it's called anyway. Uh, and, uh, and there was this door at the back with this, all this intricate pattern and the locking system. And okay, I took a picture and this was, this become like the doors of the cistern. And then of course, with my good friend, uh, sadly gone now, uh, Mr. Uh, Appleby, we created this water flow system of giant pipes and the water coming from all the sewers in the city. And then inside we had like Pennywise, um, uh, Pennywise wagon with the pile of, of toys and, 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 and clothes of the dead kids that he's accumulated over centuries. So what we did is we, the bottom of the pile is of course, like probably two, 300 years old. So it's all dark and black and, and molded and, and, and uh, full of mold and everything. And then when you go up, you can see a little bit more colors because they're more recent clothings and everything. And then, I don't know if I'm going to too fast. You tell me, Arv, you see all the pictures. Yeah, it would, be, it would be great to slow down in some of these, uh, but okay. you, you carry on and I'm gonna kind of butt in with a few questions as you okay. can. So, and then, I mean, you know, I just showed you the video, so you can see how intricate the uh, construction of the roofing was for the cistern. Mm -hmm. It was all pre-built on in, in the shop by John and his team, and then we had to assemble this and, 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 and to, uh, you know, like do all the, it's supposed to be in, in, in uh, steel, of course, so you see all the wells that were mm -hmm. built in, the panels and the paneling and everything. And then once it was lifted, we started building the walls, and then we would lower the uh, ceiling part so that it sits on the wall so that gap, gap of light would disappear right. and so that what it looked like. But before we uh, jump ahead to you're actually gonna, I, I, it would be great for you to actually show a couple more slides of the interiors, but before we jump ahead to that, um, in terms of uh, uh, getting this drawn up, was there a model built? Was there uh, a concept sketch uh, work done, concept art work done? Were there drawings? Was it a SketchUp model that you did? How was this manifested so that you could translate it to the, the construction team? Yeah, yeah. There was a there was an illustration, and there were like many, many, many versions, SketchUp version of the whole thing. But that's Henry Fong's illustration right. of what we had in mind to start with. Mm -hmm. And so you can already see, you know, the the puddles, the reflections on the floor. You could see the water giant pipes with water pouring into the uh, opening in the floors, in the floor, and then you see also the the the, the, the children floating at the top of the cistern. Mm -hmm. And of course, our set was built roughly up to here, but then all the rest was set extension, and 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 the kids floating were part of that extension. Right, and this is this particular set is sort of the finale of the movie and uh, and uh, or the first part of the movie, uh, and uh, basically there's a lot of action in it uh, going through the tunnels, etc. Uh, was that predetermined, or did the director come aboard after your plans were done and sort of make adjustments? It's funny that you ask because every morning as we were meeting. Mm -hmm there was always like a little change. So we had to pursue that change during the day and present it the morning after. Right. And it, it, I tell you, I think we spent about two months designing the tunnels. Mm -hmm. And the tunnels did have to fit on stage two. Mm -hmm. So there was not much room to, to build any tunnels. So we had to plan all the, the, the champ contre champ, the reverse angles so that we could so that we had to actually, we could actually run through it to them like four hours and, and nobody would ever notice that we're in the same tunnel. We were like a flash ago, you know, it's like, yeah. it was like, it was extremely fast. Right. And also there were like various, various tunnels. There were like the actually, the actual sewers, there were the tunnels, there was the tunnel that Pennywise digged with his claws, mm -hmm. uh, also that the kid, reach by going down the well and everything. Uh, for those who have seen the movie, they know what I'm talking about. Uh, mm -hmm. And if you haven't seen the movie, it's a really good movie. Uh, it's funny because when I, when, I, when I was called for that movie, I didn't, honestly, I didn't have a clue what it was about. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm not a big fan of horror movies and I'm neither a big fan of Stephen King books. 
so I, I it, it opened a whole new world of uh, a new new scope of of literature and uh, and uh, and and story uh, horror story to, to tell. So you can see on this picture here that we had all the uh, the, the lines, the marks of the phosphate in the in the clothing, and also the change of color. Like this is not the lighting effect. This is a paint job that uh, uh, Cameron Brooks crew created. I mean, these guys were fabulous. And this is like what's under the, the pile of clothing. It's just ribs of plywood that we cut and we assembled and then we stuck. And then we painted a, a, a backing that we could light through mm -hmm. so that you could have like very strong backlight effects. And that was the lid that was put on uh, at the end, and so we're 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 finished with that file here. Amazing. So was the clothing uh, something that the set decoration department uh, put yeah. on? Yeah. Were set you specific with sort of what you uh, you know you basically put the ages of the clothing, I suppose, in creating your layers? Well, not necessarily in the clothing per se, because it's fabric, but in the toys we did. Yes, okay. we brought in toys from the turn of the past century. In and we were like, you know, it, it, but it was like, it was a big dressing job. It was, it was kind of really well done. Rosalie Board was the set decorator and she did with her crew an amazing job. So it was like all oh, really, it was a great experience overall. And you know, for a $35 million movie that made $700 million at the box office, I think we can call it a success. Right. Did you have points, Claude? Ah! <laughs> I wish. I wish. <laughs> no, it's like it's it's work of love. <laughs> Pretty amazing. Um, uh, just one couple more questions before we move on from this uh, particular set to the. We'll go on to the uh, Rialto Bridge next. But one of the things that people wanted to know about was you're you, you're creating a lot of uh, uh, fantasy sets, uh, reality sets, and uh, some of them are you know of uh, of an age as an age of Adeline. They're period sets. Some are some present but semi-futuristic in terms of the jets that you create. Uh, is there a common denominator in your design? Is there something specific that you're always aiming for? Uh, and I don't mean it just beyond like, you know, we want to tell the story, of course we do, but is there just in the pure design part of it, is there something that you put into it that you like to kind of bring out in each and every set? Well, I think that there's probably one word that would uh contain all of this question and it's realism mm -hmm. i i i i mean especially nowadays i want everything to look so real no matter no matter uh what the set is what period what style what what it has to look real because now you know you you, you watch a set and you watch the painting the aging and the construction everything with your own eyes but when you're going to go see it you're going to see it on an imax 3d screen which is a grander vision than your my poor old eyes can actually judge, you know. So you have to be so careful with the finishings of each set. And I, to me, I mean, as much as I do respect uh, 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 carpentry, uh, uh, sculptors, greens, and everything, I think that the bad scenery job can ruin the whole thing. So it's like when it it comes a time to actually paint the set, I'm really hands-on and I'm I, I really like push it to maximum you can ask to uh, Cam Brooks I mean when with the sister and I think uh, I mean he was coming to me every morning Claude today's the last day we're running out of money I said no we're not running out of money I'll get you more money let's push it you know and right. and to me this is one of the most most achieved set I've done it, it's just a cistern it's just rust on on walls but it, remember that behind it is just MDF. You know, it's like it's so it's it, it's going to be like, and you'll see in the next set also sure. from from a yeah. Spider -Man. Why don't we move on to the Spider-Man one, and you can okay. kind of run us through it a little bit. Okay. So this was the uh, this. Whoops, sorry. This set is um, where we're going to uh, shoot in uh, in Venice. I mean, it's in Spider-Man. You've seen it in the trailer at the beginning in the reel. Um, uh, we're, we're um, supposed to be uh, on the Grand Canal uh, under the Rialto Bridge and there's a, a big event that happens at the beginning of the movie 
And so, uh, you know, we went there and uh, we scouted it and all great, all fun and everything. But then we looked at the maritime traffic and we said, is, how are we going to control this? How are we going to take over this place? And of course, this is before pandemic. So it's like, there's like millions of people visiting Venice like every year. So it's like, it was, it was, it was a nightmare to think that we, so we went back to London and we looked at the back lot that uh, leaves in studios. And there was this giant tank that uh, Tom Cruise was using for the last uh, Mission Impossible. And, um, and so we, we looked at it and say, well, okay, there's a shallow part, there's a deeper part. So let's use this, let's try and make it. So, because we had like, you know, because, because it's water, you have drafts to consider for the weight of the boats and everything. So uh, we said, okay, we need, we need a deeper draft for the, for the, the uh, what's this called? The vapor, Vaporetto. And we need, uh, we need shallower uh, uh, waters for the uh, gondolas and for the taxi boats and everything but still it was like it was complicated so i'm going to move on so we built you know this model was extremely useful because we had so many meetings with special effects with with the director with the visual effects of what we needed to build to actually shoot practically and then also to, to make some uh, additional uh, scenery, you know, set extensions and so on. Mm -hmm. So, Can I course, ask uh, one question? Uh, yeah. Just in terms of uh, the decision making to build this, uh, obviously the busyness of Venice, you know, precluded you from shooting there, but was it, uh, I, I'm imagining, was it a fight or was it any sort of a struggle to kind of build as much as you did? Because you built an extraordinary amount. And I'm sure somewhere in there, producers were saying, well, we can do that with green screen or we can do that with blue screen. Can you elaborate yeah. a bit? Well, I mean, what we built is probably one fourth of what was planned to be built. Right. Okay. So, you know, I mean, we, at one point there was a, there was a chase in the, in the alleys and then the, there was like, you know, along the canals and there was a chase with, I mean, uh, there was, I mean, first of all, you know, when you work on, on a movie like this, you got like, someone comes up with an idea it hits the head and the head goes down and says okay let's do this you know so we plan on it we design it we go for it and everything and then we come with a price tag and say oh are you fucking kidding me no 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 that's not what we meant okay so then we pull back and we cut down we cut down we cut down and that's what we, and that's what every movie is about i mean it's all about the price tag so it's like let's face it especially with scenery because we're the first ones to actually show up and ask for dollars so uh, so 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 we are we are there and uh, and uh, we're, we're 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 looking at this tank and this tank can be useful and we made several proposals and and i remember james lewis the art director where i i thought you know like i think we went through, through 15 uh, uh, sketchup versions of, of the scope of the whole set you know so so anyway, we, 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 we ended up being greenlit on, bi on, on, on building. So, you know, I mean, it's like we built, I tell you, this is why probably a, a minimal, uh, the minimum we could build to actually shoot the scenes in there. Mm -hmm. So you see here, that's where in the tank, we're looking at the tank and, and in the foreground is the, is the deeper uh, uh, pool. And in the back is, is still, we're still in the tank but it's shallower. You can see there's probably like a, a 10, 10 feet drop, 12 feet drop there. So we use that and all, we built everything on scaffolding so that everything would be level. And, uh, and everything at the foot of the, uh, of, the, of the Rialto Bridge, all these shops were uh, exact copies of what was out there because we actually shot at the Rialto Bridge in Venice one day on a Sunday morning really early with extras and, 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 and people. And we dressed the bridge to match our bridge and leaves them with some vendors on the side where there's normally nothing on. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and also in the shops on the side. So we, 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 we did all of that. And then we built this bridge, which, which, which is just like, there's like hundreds of bridges like this over in the canals in, in Venice but ours had to break. So we had to make a, a, a side and a B side of it, you know? So it's, uh, it's, this is like in, in prep right now. 
And all of these, you can see all the scaffolding holding the pillars coming out from the water, holding the, the boats when they're anchored and everything. And all these, 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 uh, these posts had to be precisely uh, placed, positioned, because they had to fit uh, Tom Holland rehearsal with the stunts, which were taking place elsewhere on the back lot. Uh, then, so when, when he had to run from shore to the top of the Vaporetto to try and fight the Hydro Man, he would jump on these posts. So he would rehearse uh, away from the set as we were building. But then when he was coming there, not, not there couldn't be like six inches difference on any of these posts because it would it would screw up the whole rehearsal that he did for weeks with stunt uh, director second year director George Kuro, who's just a fabulous man. Anyway, so everything was everything was made adjustable at the bottom so that we can fix any mistakes that would have happened in that. And that's why the model was so useful also in prep. The two huge model I showed you earlier, and then we had those amazing uh, 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 sculptures made by. Uh, um, we had an amazing crew of construction. We had the Colin Fraser, the construction coordinator, and Emma Denby was the, the lady who was leading all the sculptures. And I mean, they're all handmade, everything, everything you see, the column heads, I mean, they were all specifically sculpted for, and you see those column heads there, there's not one that's similar to the right. others. So they were all individually made, you know? Right. And so, Anyway, so that's the bridge after, after the A side is construction, before the destruction. And you can see the pipes coming out from the deeper part of the tank mm -hmm. uh, outside. And those pipes were going to be used for special effects when the explosion of water happens. And then you can see that the bottom of the walls is painted dark. And we, we installed those shells, you know, like, 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 in, like in Venice. Mm -hmm. with some algaes like so that when we would and that determined the, the water level you can see the what and the, you can see you can appreciate the patina and all of this mm -hmm. stuff mm -hmm. you know it's like and so we knew that when the water would would come in all these algaes would float at water level mm -hmm. and and so we started filling the tank in the shallow part and then in the meantime you know all the aging was going on it's like a, and uh and um sorry and then you can see, you know, like it's it appreciate more of the, the the back. And then boats started coming in from Venice because we we hired some taxi boats, we hired uh, some gondolas, and uh, and then you can see, you know, like water water coming in, giant pipes for special defects. Sorry, it's a joke. Special effects, and uh, and then uh, and then gondolas put in. And you know, patina under the bridge, and then can you, you know, talk a little bit about timeline as well? Because to get all this level of detail done, obviously, it's taken an extraordinary amount of time. So, you know, can you break it down in terms of time if you can remember uh, how much? Well, I would, I, because because the, the the tank was was used uh, prior to us by another show. We had to wait for them to actually wrap their stuff, you know, and. Um, and in the meantime, construction was 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 you know blitzing heavily uh, in the shops. Like all the brickwork that had to be molded, it's all plaster. You know, it's like a, so it's all the brickwork, all the uh, uh, the, the set dressing, hiring uh, everywhere. You know, we we the thing in Europe is that you know it's not like trying to cross Canada from Quebec to Vancouver with a semi of uh, of plaster. It's like you know it's uh, between Italy and, and London, I think it's a day and a half drive maximum. So it's like, you know, so we, we were lucky enough to have some great uh, uh, people working in every country, sorry, where we shot. Because on Spider-Man, there were five countries that, that we shot at. There was Spain, Italy, Czech Republic, England, and, uh, and then, no, sorry, and then the United States. So four countries, but it, it, we were supposed to be doing seven countries uh, in five countries, which we did. Right. And was but, there an art department in each country, a separate one? Yeah, yeah, I had to have another department because the, 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 the amount of work mm -hmm. was, you know, it's like, it was, it was, no, it was a huge undertaking. It was complicated because I had to scout locations. So I was, I think I did fly around 30 times 
uh, in, in a period of time of about six months in and out of, of, of London mm-hmm. while we were prepping in London. Right, amazing. Anyway. And do you remember uh, in terms of, and if you can even speak about this, uh, sort of a budget for a set like this? I think that uh, I think that that set was about you know probably uh, we're talking pounds here. Mm-hmm. I'd say probably a million two. Okay, well that seems so, they I think they got a bargain basically. Yeah, well I mean they got you know they say that's what that's, they have to pay. That's pretty amazing for that set. That's a really decent number. I know I'm joking. So <laughs> you see those those divers there, you know they're they're standing at the bottom of the pond there of mm-hmm. the tank. So it's like. It was it was very well under control, and and you can see you know the blue screen is obviously like the the, the matte line for uh, for for special effects, and at the bottom all these shops at the bottom of the Rialto Bridge were exact replica, including the terrace and everything that mm. that happens in in uh, in Venice, and then you know on the reverse you can see the boys there the divers having a meeting and you know working in the we parked the taxi boat there. Mm-hmm. And 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 you can see this is this is my favorite probably my favorite part of the set. It's a small small area, but it's really nice, and that's so Venice Venetian. Mm-hmm. And and also you know as you notice the water now is getting murkier and murkier mm-hmm. because we had to hide all the piping, the uh, all the, uh, the the special effects pipes and 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 also the the scaffolding underwater. Right. So you ended up tinting the water, basically. Paint, oh, yeah. Tainting the water and you can't mess it up because if you go too far, coming back is hell. So we went, mm-hmm. it took about four days to get it right. You know, like four days back, come back in the morning. And that's the morning of the shoot, you know, with all the lighting and, and you can see the crew there just uh, sipping the when we had, when we had crews on set for, for filming. Um, and right. that that's another angle and uh that's that's exactly if you go to to venice and you go at the bottom of the rialto bridge that's what you're going to get mm-hmm. and, you know there was like long shots there was like really nice angles that you could play with and so on right so may i ask you about uh, not just camera angles but also about lighting and especially kind of lighting for the cistern set uh, which we saw just a little bit earlier uh you know it's so dependent on the director of photography to kind of they, just as you said, you know, uh, bad scenic work can ruin a set. Bad lighting can ruin a set as well. Uh, and I think a lot of directors tend to rely on production designers often to kind of give them ideas of angles. And we'll see that when you talk about uh, another, another one of your sets coming up. But in this one and in the cistern set, were you particularly sort of uh, um, cognizant of and did you make your director and director of photography aware of what the camera angles were and how you potentially saw it being lit basically well yeah but you know i mean a, a machine like this was just like you know you're 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 you're, you're writing or you're trying to captain uh, a transatlantic ship right but these guys they drive it like it's a yacht so mm-hmm. it's like we were we were sometimes you know surprised by the requests of uh, last minute week requests or or last minute changes of of direction and so on. Mm-hmm. And the alley I showed you earlier, where this is a, this is my favorite part, mm-hmm. was the part where I thought that you know Tom Holland, uh, aka Peter Parker, would actually be running up on the walls and everything. But the director picked another area, which mm-hmm. I thought was like just a back you know, a backing as part of the set. Mm-hmm. And, 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 and so, you know, the lighting had to work on it. And then, you know, luckily what you do when you do a set like this, this size, is you go more uh, like a theater set. You, you, and you augment, you enhance the aging on the walls. You, you push it farther because you know that if it's a sunny day, it's gonna be like just a white wall. Like actually on this picture, you can see that the patina on the building there is really washed out. It was a pinkish building. Mm-hmm. And you know, it's like when you when you when you work on sets this size, you really want to augment it. So luckily that little hallway, that little not hallway, but little alley that he picked mm-hmm. was uh was aged enough. And and with, with the lighting, you know, you're really dependent on on just lighting additions because 
you know, you're, you're out there, you're, you're outside. So if it's a sunny day, and actually that year, 2018 in England was probably the hottest summer ever in years. Mm -hmm. It was really, really, the fields were brown. Everything was like, you know, we, we think of London like in a rainy place and everything. It wasn't, it wasn't at all. So this picture here I'm showing you is just another piece of scenery that we built, which is the top of the bridge because we didn't build the whole bridge. It would have been, I mean, this bridge is humongous when you walk it in reality. So we just built that section so that when, when uh, 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 Spider-Man is attacked by, uh, by Ultraman, he's being pushed, like, as we saw in the, uh, in, the, um, in, the, in the reel, he's being pushed against the railing. And, and, and you know, so this is what's just, just one piece of scene that we built for that part. And then those are images from him uh, running on the pillars as I described that had to be precisely placed so that it would match what he was rehearsing with the stunts. But this is not like, you know, he's like, he's like hung by a cable on a harness by a crane, which is probably like 60 feet high up and he's, he's supported. So he never falls, never hurts himself, but still he has to do the mechanical of running the whole thing. You know? Right, and how many days of shooting was on this set, Claude? That's another of my favorites picture. Uh, uh, I don't know, it was probably like a main unit, probably like a week. Mm -hmm. And second unit, probably like a week and a half. Right, amazing. Yeah, uh, yeah let's give this picture its due. It's beautiful. Uh, yeah. The amount of detail in there is unbelievable. Yeah, but also I want to show you, see this is how we did the waves. Mm -hmm. They had two backo, giant backo, and they had like barrels welded together attached to their arm and they were just battering the water so that the, the so that the uh, water ripple would, would 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 come all the way to the set they were at the extreme other end of the set right so that that's how we did the waves when we were shooting and then of course i mean the more imaging and then this is the exact rooftop where where spider-man really makes eye contact with Iron man so so that was that was rialto bridge beautiful Beautiful. Um, shall we move on to uh, Gene's father's neighborhood from- Yeah, uh, Gene's father's neighborhood. I mean, just uh, Now this one we need to uh, talk about in terms of what prompted you to want to build this as opposed to finding it as a location. And then we know we, one of the houses gets destroyed in it, but what prompted you to build it rather than finding a location where you could build a house that could get destroyed, for example? Well, what happened is that you know, as every movie, you are, you start and, and there's an idea that, you know, it's, it's even on the page that there's going to be like a street where Jean goes and sees her father and, uh, and so on. And then the X-Men go there with the X-Jet and they land on the street. So that already is like, okay, wind effect, uh, visual effects. And, uh, and then uh, they come out and then there's an explosion. Oh, explosion, okay. So, and then, uh, and then uh, you know, the first AD comes in and says, well, we're gonna need about, uh, I don't know, uh, two weeks of shoot on that street. So, you know, you, you, you go and scout some streets and you say, how can we take control of a street like this and, and, and you know, put these guys under, <laughs> under our control and, you know, it's, it's, it's very expensive to do that. Just, just the whole unit. I mean, just even to park the whole unit on a show like X-Men where you got like at least, I don't know, like 20 semis full of equipment of all sorts, you know? And, and, and you try and go and, 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 and in a little part of town in Montreal because that movie was shot in Montreal. And, and, and you think that, oh my God, forget it. It's like, it's, the, the base camp is going to be like three miles away. It's going to, you know, so, and then you drive back to the office and everybody is like mulling over this and say, okay, so how much was it cost to not bring like all this crew out there for two weeks and build it in the back lot? So you just go in, in, in the office and the art department and you, you sit down and you know how much you bring in the construction coordinator, your art directors and everything. And how much does it cost to build a shell? Just the shell of a house. So. Anyway, so so that that's what happened, and then we came up with a price, and we walked the back lot at uh, Mel's in Montreal, and 
and this is what happened. And and Réjean Brochu and his team and and uh, Alain Giguère and his team did an amazing job. And so are the art directors who did supervise this. So this is a quick uh, time lapse that I've put. Through. I mean, it it shows you the date at the bottom. So it's a uh, 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 May 8, 2017. So I'm going to move as smoothly as I could. You can see that we start, you know, delimiting a street, putting down some uh, pads, solid pads for the houses, and then the flats that are being built in the shop are coming in. Am I going too fast or you guys see oh, it? This is great. We can okay. see it. And then, you, you know, we had the roofs. The roofs were pre-built and they were brought on, uh, it's just, uh, you know, like a regular wheel, wheel set of wheels. And then they were craned up on the roof of the houses of the shells and everything was held inside by giant concrete blocks with cables. And then, you know, we started bringing in some poles and electric, I mean, phony electrical wires. And then some trees were, fake trees were brought in. And then we, I started build. I mean, not me, but I mean, of course, again, I have to, I have to insist that without everybody that I work with, I'm nobody. I mean, this is like, this is just an idea, a thought that we develop all together. You know, I mean, these people are just amazing that I love to work with. And, uh, and so, and then you see time lapse. And then we started building the wall that would be the blue screen at that end of the street. So I moved, I moved to the other end, onto the bridge that we were building. And you can see the houses, like, you know, they all have their identity. And we, on purpose, had a, a character in our mind for each of these houses. So you can see that we decided to have no sidewalk built. And the bridge is there because nobody wants to stop in that neighborhood. This neighborhood is like, it's a no man's land. It's like, and at the end of the street there, where you see the blue screen now, is a field with electrical pylons. And it's like, it's, it's, it's a no man's land. I'm just gonna run slowly so you can see the bridge, the, side, the shadow of the bridge going by. As the day goes by, you see the shadow of the bridge appearing on the, on the tarmac, I like that. Mm -hmm. So anyway, so this, you see at the end of this, we started like what? Uh, we're the 22nd, 23rd of July at this point, which is a nice piece of information. Mm -hmm. Can I ask, uh, let's talk specifically about the two ends, and I know you have photos of the middle section we'll get into. So yeah. you specifically created the bridge. That was your idea. It wasn't a director idea. Or it wasn't a script idea. That was yours. And I want to ask about that, and I'd like to, to elaborate a little bit. And then on the other end, where the blue screen is, the idea of putting that electrical grid, the imagery of all those towers and wires, where did that come from? Well, I, it's funny because we were shooting at another location. First of all, at one point on this show, I'm just trying to locate the, uh, the image that will trigger the street here. Hold on, I'm sorry. Um, as I say, this is my permanent exhibition and I, I don't go to the museum every day. So uh, um, where is it? Oh, there it is. Okay. So uh, yeah, the, uh, this is the model. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I like to use uh, that, um, uh, uh, what's it called, this, uh, this app again? Oh, Artemis. Artemis, yeah. I like to use that, especially when we do a, a model work and everything. Uh, what happened is that I wanted to build a bridge because I want to give the impression that this is a place where nobody stops. This is like there's a highway up there and everybody drives by. This is the no man's land. This is like a poor bastard's place and everything. Nobody wants to stop there. And at both ends of the, of the, of the street, of course, we have to put blue screen because you can't build endlessly. And one of the, as I said, as I said there was like at one point uh, five backlots and 11 stages going on at once on that show. And one of the backlots was outside town. And I was, as I was driving by, I mean, going to visit the construction and everything, I would drive by this field with, with big electrical pylons and a little a shack where there would be like, a, you know, like probably employees and, and people just monitoring what's going on in that field and everything. And I took pictures and I brought it in and I say, okay, let's put that at the end of that road. 
just showing that how much this is the end of the world, that there's nothing there other than, than, than electrical pylons. So, so uh, and at the other end of the road, uh, below the bridge was intentionally uh, built there so that we could have like a very clean uh, mat line so that we could build the extension of the road with the same type of housing. And of course, you know, it's like these houses like are, you know, lower, lower, uh, not even middle, lower class, lower class people. So, you know, from the model to the, to the set, this is a picture of the set. You can see that, you know, we have here the clown house. We, we, had, we had a character for each of these houses, you know. That's the reverse. So we see the clown house at the far end here. And then this is the uh, Italian old lady's house. She's, she really has a nice garden. She's proud. She's got, she's got their character together. She's like, you know, she takes care of, she has plants. This is like the guy who's never there. He has a huge Mack truck, which I found, which we found that I didn't find it. I mean, I don't find anything, I just find trouble. But anyway, so this guy, the, the Mack truck owner, you know, he's never there. So he doesn't give a, a damn about this place. He's, it's a dump. And he lives by the bridge. He doesn't care about, about anything. And, uh, and across it is the, is the um, uh, what do you call it, a divorced couple. The house is for sale. They're like, you know, it's, it's sad that the, there's a, a kid's toy here, you know, a, a big wheel toy there that's not being used and nobody's there. And you see, okay, let me just go back here. I'm sorry, I, I missed a cue here. Okay, so you see that bridge is built right next to this house. And on the other side of the road, you see this house with the bridge built there. Everybody follows. And then with the set extension under the bridge, uh, visual effects and uh, put in what we, what we had planned, which is the set extension of the street per se. Mm -hmm. so it's all CG here. Fantastic. And the bridge is like, and also on the bridge, I don't know if I can, I can enlarge it, but the bridge, you have two height panels because I purposely asked the bridge not to be leveled. I like the fact that this is like 12 foot feet, 12 foot four inches, and this is 13 feet one inch. Right. And I remember the, the, the set designer said, why do you want to do that? I said, I just want to do it. I think it's great. I think it's like engineers don't give a shit about this neighborhood. And this, this is going up. So it's like, uh, by the way, merci Renaud Chamberlain. So uh, anyway, this is, a, uh, this is like the hero house here. And you can see that, you know, this is like the guy who goes uh, to Florida. If he makes it, sometimes he stops in South Carolina because they run out some money for the gas. But that's his house there. And that's his Winnebago. Right. And this is seen from the, uh, the lady uh, at, the, at the, anyway, so there's lots yeah. of pictures here. Sorry, Look, can, you, can you speak a little bit about uh, color? And I want to sort of shoot it back to um, one of the questions that's popped up in terms of, color and testing for the color. Uh, even on the Rialto Bridge, you spoke about sort of, you know, not knowing what the sun was going to do and something could get washed out. Were there color tests and camera tests done in these larger outdoor sets? Yeah, well, you know, it's funny because that movie had one specific uh, aspect that, uh, that I had never experienced before is that, you know, you go through previs, you go through storyboards, you go through, but this time we had a uh, VR. Previous. So right, yes. basically what they did is they took the whole set and they put it in the VR mm -hmm. so that you could actually do really high angle shots, you know, drone shots without having to go out there and use a drone. Mm -hmm. And you could, you could, you know, like do all the action scenes, the landing of the X jet at the end of the road. Mm -hmm. And that, by the way, I just want to, on this picture to underline all the work that the dress, set dressing is done on the wiring and, 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 the, and the posts and the electrical posts and everything. I mean, this is all fake. It's just great, you know. So, yeah. and yes, yeah, so so there was like lots of uh, you can see lighting on the morning, of course. I mean, also the other thing is with the uh, Mauro Fiore, the DOP, we did orient the street so that that the light was not crossing left to right, but from one end to another. Mm -hmm. So, so in the morning we would start at one end, looking at one end, and uh, and then at the end of the day looking at the other end. So we were basically always backlit which was which was creating really nice imaging you know and then you can see of course all the money they spent on lighting 
which you know like with all the cranes and all the, the mm -hmm. diffusions and everything it was like non-stop plus you know nowadays you've got techno crane like the, the 16 whatever all right. full time on set and, and then you basically uh, destroyed so much of that house and some of the street how involved are you in terms of uh, determining what that's going to be well first of all we got to determine what happens inside the house because in between before and after the explosion on the a side and the b side there's a whole scene taking place inside the house mm -hmm. and then you know what happens at the end of the fight is going to be uh, shown outside the house which is what happens here mm -hmm. And so uh, what we did is we, uh, we uh, of course, I'm, when, when these things happen, I'm always really paranoid because I've, you know, I've been in this business for long enough to know that you, don't, you just don't let special effects take care of it. Mm -hmm. You want construction to be part of it so that everything is broken in a way that, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't show uh, skill as marks, you know, where the breakage happened. Yes. And, uh, and so, so I, I, and nowadays, you know, when you make a movie, you always have to make an A side budget and a B side budget for most of the sets because there's so much, I don't know, maybe the movies I'm working on, but there's lots of destruction going on. So it's always like, so yes, I'm very paranoid about, about, about stuff like that. And I, as I said, you know, you can ruin the credibility of scenery just with bad aging, bad painting, bad carpentry, but you cannot let go you have to be on the floor all the time you know yeah and same i mean to just extrapolate your point a little bit same with the uh, special effects when physical effects doesn't don't go right or the result doesn't look right it just takes you out of the movie as well and i think a lot of production designers uh want to see sort of what the end result's going to be did you do any tests for this thing uh, as you were going along well what we did is we i mean we didn't we didn't break the house and that's it that was it i mean we, we break the house and then we put it back all mint perfect together and then we were ready to actually do the explosion right because right. you know the explosion happens on camera but before it happens it has to be perfectly well done you know mm -hmm. so so we had an a side and a b side that and i i can show you that imaging later on if we make it to uh to sure. uh, it uh, it uh, bathroom scene. Yeah, why don't we move along? Uh, I think yeah. this is well, that's, that's the X jet. You know that you, we cannot afford to to build the whole X jet, but we had a we could we were able to afford building a leg of it that that landed on the street. Mm -hmm. uh, totally. Uh, I mean, there's so much great pictures of that set. Oh, and by the way, okay, sorry. So you see here at the end of the street, you can see the the electrical truck with the with the whatever you call it. The boom. The, the boom, yeah, yes. and you see the blue screen. Yes. But then on the next shot, to screen, this is what it looks like. My 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 field with the uh, the, the thing that I was driving by most mornings when I was going to see that backlot. Right. So this is this is the set extension in place. You see. Very nice. Um, Claude, let me ask you about your team. Um, when you put together an art department, uh, you can talk about what's important to you. But uh, the follow up question, in a way, is um do you work with same people uh, all the time do you are you sort of the only member sometimes uh, uh who goes into a new uh jurisdiction and you don't know anybody and you sort of start to find people how do you kind of pull it all together well i most of the time i mean if not all the time i travel by myself mm -hmm. i uh i have no ties no uh and, and honestly, I think that when you get into a, a foreign city, you're, you're just like a guest and, and you meet, you know, you meet, of course, you're brought in to meet the best supervising art directors, the best set decorators and everything that, that are in town. And most of the time, these people have done like big movies. Mm -hmm. You know, you go to London, these guys have made bigger movies than I've done mm -hmm. many times, you know, so it's like, you go to Vancouver, and I had I had the opportunity to work with amazing people in Vancouver, and even in Toronto. You know, I went to Toronto, and I, you know, I, I I worked. First of all, I started working in Toronto like the early '80s. So then, when I went back, I was like, okay, so where uh, where's the select? 
oh, it's not on Queen Street anymore. Oh, I see. It. It's there now. It's much bigger. But anyway, so so uh, so it's like you know, it's it's a uh, it's a. Uh, uh, I don't, I don't believe in to bringing, I mean, yes, you're a scenic painter. I would, I would travel with the scenic painter that I worked with for years, Danny Gigam, always. Mm -hmm. And if I work in a, in a place in Canada where there's no real film crews, I would bring in, uh, I would bring in a, a whole unit. Mm -hmm. But most of the cities now, you know, I, I've been working in Nova Scotia or New Brunswick in a long, long time. So I don't know what it looks like out there. But right now, I think that, you know, I'm 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 happy to travel by myself and trust the people that I hire in these cities because they know everybody, they know all the resources, they know they know all about them. So it's like, why would I bother? You know? Right. So again, you see the you see the bridge there on that picture. I like the 13 foot one and 12 foot four mm -hmm. uh, on one side and the other side. And this is like all wood. It's like it looks like real real rust. Fabulous, and it's great framing as well. Yeah. Okay, so that's done. We're done with that one. Sure. Let's move on to the uh, Niebold house. Niebold house. Okay. Interior and exterior. Okay, let's, uh, let's, let's just show you a little clip here just to take a breather. Hit MP4. Okay, so this is just a promo that I did, uh, not myself. Again, I don't do anything. I just, I just, I just get help from people. And this was for the uh, ADG Awards uh, in L.A., and uh, I, I, I hoped, I had hoped that, that it was going to be noticed or nominated and nothing happened with it. But I did create with a, a really good editor this uh, little clip. I'm going to leave on the, 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 the sound and uh, we'll, we'll look at pictures after, okay? Okay. I mean, it's like you know, you would you would hope that a, a movie this simple, uh, with with this much scope to it, that was not on really on the page. By the way, mm -hmm. you know, I came in this movie and I really wanted to uh, to give it my my very best, and and I knew uh, the Muschietti's because I had met them beforehand on uh, on Mama. I uh, was introduced there by uh, Guillermo del Toro. And uh, sadly, I don't know, it, it didn't work out. The money wasn't there, not for me, but, you know, for the, my, 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 my pitch and everything. So, uh, and, then, and then they called me back and, and, and we really connected on it. And I really enjoyed working with, with both of them, Barbara, Andy, and Marty Ewing, and everyone in Toronto were, was just fantastic. And uh, and so we 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 had this Nebel house to build, and uh, and to house and to uh, and and it was like uh, you know it's a challenge because you think of Psycho, you think of all these horror movies with like those amazing houses and everything, and you don't want to just copy that. You you want to be original, you want to be different, you want to be like, and it's the most important set of the movie for that character for, 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 for Pennywise because it's the porthole to his lair on the ground. So it's like, you know, so anyway, we, we scouted a lot, uh, uh, Randy, uh, Morgan and I, and we, we found this lot in, uh, in Oshawa in Ontario. And uh, it was great because it was across the street from an empty field. So, so, so then we, we decided that we would build it there. So we, we basically, you know, erected scaffolding, and meanwhile, in the shop, we built all the components of the house. Mm -hmm. 
Right, Claude, may I, um, we can get into the details of the house, but I'm getting a couple of questions which are quite interesting about sort of the politics of building, meaning you have, obviously each time you do something like this, you have to sell it to the director. So, and to the producers, of course, who are sort of responsible for the budget of it. Uh, but the question is, how, uh, how do you kind of pitch to the director what you're going to build, essentially? Uh, and in terms of money, how do you kind of pitch to the producers how much it's going to cost? Because this is a substantial build, and it took up. And, and you know, I'm guessing sort of the size of the lot determined the size of your build. You could have gone bigger, you could have gone smaller. But how did all that manifest itself? Well, you know, I mean, if you're going to call me to design a movie, you know, I'm going to build shit. You know, it's like it's I'm I'm like. I love building. I, I've, I've, I've learned designing by building. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I'm, I, I like to do huge builds. You know, it's like uh, I, I remember once when I was younger and, and dumber, I was, I was saying, I wish I could build a, a set that would be noticed by a, a satellite up in the space. You know, it's like, mm -hmm. a, uh, it's, it's, you know, it's not, it's not that difficult because you just prove to them that there's no way you're going to find a place that is going to be that scary uh, mm -hmm. across a field where you're going to put some. And by the way, when we built that house, I mean, we had, it was across the field, uh, across in the field every weekend, there was a crowd gathering together and doing powwows and jams. And, and it was like, a, and they, they were like, they were like a, a venere, how do you say in English, venere, they were like praising the house. They were like, it was Pennywise house. It was like, they were kind of, you know, the whole soul of the house was, was on them. And they were like, I mean, it was like, you know, it's Oshawa. So just to start with, uh, people from Ontario will probably know what I mean. But anyway, so uh, it's, it's like, a, it's, it, was, it, was, it was not complicated to sell the idea because it was just a shell. And the shell didn't, didn't cost that much money. I think it was probably like, I don't know, 300 Fifty thousand dollars, if if that. You know, that okay. stuff. I'm sorry to say, not, not not much money, but anyway. So we built we built all these components, and then we assembled it on site. Mm -hmm. You know, like it was quickly. It was a quick assemble. It was nothing complicated. Mm -hmm. And then uh, with the and then we uh, of course I had some. You know, the set dressing was on the road, trying to find some architectural elements, and we found this great fence with pieces of trees cut in the in the structure per se. So we built our own extensions of the same pattern with the address 29 Nebold Street. And then and then you know we, we found a tree, a dead tree on the road uh, on the way to these to the stages. And uh, and we went to ring the doorbell at the, at the guy's place and we said can we buy you a dead tree? Of course and we, we got like a stare face and anyway so uh, so we gave the guy a thousand bucks and we planted in a new tree. We took the tree and carefully moved it back to the stage. And we built an extension at the bottom because it was too short. Mm -hmm. And so we brought it at the house and we, for, for, in order to solve the window problem, I had the uh, graphic department, uh, which was a great department, to print uh, old vintage newspaper both sides, mm -hmm. both sides, I insist, because, you know, newspaper is printed on both sides, no matter when. Yeah. And then we placed the tree, we placed the, 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 the paper in the windows and everything. We had some really nice signs made uh, by the graphics and we put our, our you can see the 29 knee bolt fence here. And then the municipality had put an extra fence in front of it. And then you see the empty field across the road where we had those really old, early early uh, uh, 90s cars, all rusted. Mm -hmm. And that was the look of the house. And I really, I took care of positioning the tree the way I wanted so that it, it points at the house. It's like, ooh, it says lots, you know? Right. And you can see all the vines growing on the outside. The greens are amazing in this. Yeah. yeah. So on the, on the inside, when we walk inside, the the am I full screen here? I think I am. Yeah. When we move in inside the house, that was shot in Toronto, and I don't remember the name of the street or anything. But this place was actually used 
for housing some uh, girls who were single moms and had to uh, find a place so that they could be secured for whatever reason. So there was lots of, of security devices like metal doors, uh, uh, bars, and, 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 and all sorts of protective devices built in, but the place was not used anymore and it was go going to be turned into condos. So we were given like green light to do whatever we wanted in there. So I walked in there and, and went, whoops, sorry, and went crazy. And, uh, and, and, and so we had, we even some, had some rats brought in there. You can see in the really foreground on the right hand side, mm -hmm. and then the kids walk in and there's like, we did all the vines hanging from the ceiling from the exterior so that we could join the exterior to the interior, plus all the, 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 um, the cobwebs done by uh, my, my good friend, defunct uh, uh, Warren Appleby, that I thank again and salute again. And we had all the debris put in on the floor and everything. And you can see like the cobwebs mixed with all the vines inside and the gorgeous newspaper in the windows so that we didn't know where we were. And of course, then there's many, there was the staircase was all enclosed into these bars and these glass sections and, you know, all reinforced and they took all that down so that we could benefit uh, the, 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 the wonderful staircase with all the arches and everything. And then on the upper floors, we had some, some scenes going on there and, and, and in the kitchen and you can see the staircase that was all opaque, all obstructed. We couldn't see it when we walked in the house at first at the beginning. Mm -hmm. And then when we went into the basement that was connected to the kitchen, now we're in Hamilton, Ontario, and we're in a place that used to be like a, a, a bottle company or we're making bottles and stuff. And then, you know, that place, Arv, you told me you saw that set. So yes. We, what's it called? Do you remember? Uh, no, I don't remember the name, but I've worked there as well. And we built yeah. a set upstairs while you guys were working downstairs, apparently. Yeah. So basically, when I went downstairs, I saw there was a giant atrium and it was a, there it is. So, and, and I decided, let's build a, a floor here and put a hole in the middle so we can plant the well so that the kids could actually really go down the well into the set. So that's what we did. And this is like really the entry of the underground, the sewers for Pennywise. Mm -hmm. And it was great because we could shoot, you know, from the bottom to the top. And then from that, from then on, when they go down, we enter the claw uh, dig tunnel that Pennywise has done. Uh, thank you to Cam, Cam Brooks. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, it's, and then we're on stage in the sewers. Right. And then there's some scenes in the kitchen the kids that are really scared. Again, Rosalie board work on, on, on set dressing. Um, Pennywise. Let me ask you a general question as we sort of go through these. Um, in terms of you actually getting the job, um, do you do a lookbook in your, for your pitch or are you hired basically on your uh, previous work? Uh, do you specifically tailor something to each uh, show that you're uh, interviewing for? <coughs> Funny that you asked because recently, I mean, as I said, I mean, this is, this is my, my permanent exhibition. I mean, there's like probably like a few thousand pictures in, in, on that website. But anyway, uh, plus all the extras, the reels and the, and the, and the time lapse. But um, I sometimes I'm not asked to do a presentation like, and I won't name any name or, or anything like that, but uh, Sometimes people expect me to make a pitch with, you know, like a lookbook or, you know, mood boards and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And I, I tend to be very prudent when I do that. Mm -hmm. So what I do using my, my website is I put together a whole digital presentation and I create a file that I hide in the website. Mm -hmm. And I say, okay, you go to my website and your file is named uh, in development and, and the code name of the movie, let's say. Right. So they have to go through the website and find their own file, you know? Right. And then they show, they see, they see my presentation. And if they want, I can talk to them as they look at it. But 
if if not i i just you know i let them i just let them uh, uh, look at it and come back to me you know it's like but but i i i i, I don't know i tend not to make a presentation because i i know people who've done it on an extent in an extensive way and the director did not like probably one image and he didn't get the job or she didn't get right. it so it's like it's very tricky it's a catch-22 you have to be very careful and that's why i want to meet the director every morning that i work on a movie every morning at least for 15 20 minutes mm -hmm. that we go through quickly go through what the art department has worked on the, night, the day before you know it's like it. and when this doesn't happen you lose track you and, and 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 the worst thing you can have is a bad surprise on the morning of the shoot when the director says oh i didn't see this i don't like that right you know it's like you don't want to go there you don't want to be there you don't want to be in that position ever ever mm -hmm. all right uh well that's amazing should we uh move on to the x jet uh, can we move on to the uh star jet first yes absolutely sir. i like the star jet better. sorry <laughs> so this is like a the great illustration this is uh uh, there are several illustrations, but we worked on that jet for so long and with so many changes. And, you know, Stark is a billionaire, multi-billionaire character. So it had to look like really spectacular. And I think it does. I mean, I really like the look of it. And I like, you know, it's, 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 it's got some landing. Uh, it's like, a, uh, I don't remember the name of the Harrier. It's like a Harrier landing gear and everything. It's got this laser beam gun at the front and everything and that uh, it you know it lands on a on a dime and so on and that was a very important in the story and so uh and then you got the uh, the gear which we built we built when when the when the when the plane lands in the movie we just built that little part here and all the rest was cg the plane was always cg anyway so it's like a, so anyway and then that's a that's a, a a printed model, which is great. I mean, you know, it's like printing in three D now is just the trend, and it's it's fun because you actually actually do some really nice props. And uh, and so that was the model of the actual set on stage, reverse inside, uh, wide sections, wild sections, and that's the workshop area at the back of the plane where uh, uh, Spider-Man prints his new suit. Nice. So we're on stage here, and this is, this is the, the set in construction, uh, or, or almost, almost all built. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and uh, you can see the gate here for the workshop at the back there. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we're inside the cockpit. I mean, you know, this thing was built from zero from scratch there was nothing so everything you see is built molded sculpted uh and you can see during the shoot uh that funny character and you know everything the seats the belts i mean it was it was all built this all these scenes were done by by prop makers you know and then all the bar and it is you know, of course this uh, stark is uh, has a really uh, funky lifestyle and you got even you know the details and the graphics, Stark Industries, you know, and and you got all the uh, the the buttons for uh, shadowing the window, soundtrack, and everything, the uh, sound system. But can you speak a little bit about your research and sort of uh, 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 you know a set like this doesn't come the first time. You research a lot. You do many iterations of it. Uh, there are some ideas as you have to give up on some you have to sort of drive a little further can you speak of sort of how complex it is to kind of pull together something like this well first of all you know when when you start designing something like this with illustrators and set designers there's no limits i mean you know this is a spider-man movie you know you're you're 200 mil you, you really want to go for it and this is star jet it's just like not just just anybody's jet it's star jet so it's and by the way that jet at the end of the shoot was dismantled and shipped to la from london so just to give you an idea mm -hmm. so it's it's basically you you don't want to hold back you just really want to 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 go to go for it you know and and by the way this is a reflection in the bar of the set of the, of the set in the background and this is the gate that goes into the workshop uh 
Yeah, so basically, you, 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 I don't know. I mean, I don't honestly, I, I don't remember how much that costed, but I know that this design work here is very much from the big collider references that I had. Right. You know, all this piping and all this thing and all these, and, and all the tools also, it's like, you know, all these tools were handmade by prop makers in London, you know, mm -hmm. and it's like, you know, you just, you just, you know, it's, 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 a, it's, it's not, it's, it's just, I mean, you know, you know what, what, what I regret a little bit now is that when we, when I started making movies, you had to go to the library, open books and <laughs> look at stuff, you know, right. You really had to, now you just turn on your computer, and I can show you at least 15 movies which have the same set in them. Because yeah. it's like, it's the second image you go, you go, you find on Google or Pinterest or something like that when mm. you get to it, you know? I think that there's not enough research done anymore. That's why most movies and visual effects especially very much look the same now. You know? mm. and, mm. And, and that's what, I mean, when I look for illustrators, I really want to have illustrators that have done something that they've never seen before. And it's very difficult to come across. Yeah, fair enough. Now, were there uh, sort of new techniques used? There are such beautiful and unique shapes and forms that you've put in here. In terms of kind of manufacturing this jet, was there something new to you that you hadn't seen before that you did in uh, sort of real well, this? Manufacturing the whole thing. I mean, you know, this, this, this component here, Mm -hmm. It's just MDF, but sanded and, and airbrushed. And it's like, it's just, it was like uh, the amount of work of hours put in, that they put in, in the making of and all the built-in lighting, you know, working with a, with a, 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 a art department assigned, set deck assigned a lighting crew was amazing. It's just like, you know, you just, of course the means are different, Arv, you know, it's like it's, it sky's the limit. So you just go crazy. You say, I want this, I want that. You come back and two days later and it's done. You know, it's like, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's not, it's not a matter of designing anymore. It's a matter of, I mean, the only limit to, 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 to the technology is your imagination. So it's, this is what I try, I thrive for, thrive for. I, I, this is what I, I want to have endless imagination and push people to their limit and to not, not, not in a bad way, in a good way. So, so forget the money, just forget the money. You know, in the end, the quality remains and the price is forgotten and never quote me for that. But anyway, so it's like, <laughs> absolutely true. Um, all right. Uh, do we want to talk about the, the X jet a little X -Jet, bit? Uh, X jet. So X jet is a total different vehicle. It, it, it's meant, to be more uh, practical, uh, it's uh, it's meant to go in space. In this case, it's supposed to be to go in space, and you can see that at the back there's also a gate there, so that we never see the end of the jet, because mm -hmm. you know limited budget. But also, I think it's a smart way of using it because what we had beyond this was a video wall that would on which we projected on which we had this the rest of the airplane, the cargo area. And through the lens effect of the glass, you don't see it now, but we'll see it later. We do see that there's something beyond that. And of course, we got uh, Mystic, which is like great. Anyway. So, I mean, you know, I'm not a big sci-fi movie uh, guy, mm -hmm. but I really enjoy designing this movie. And you see all the, the trellis that's on the wall there to create layers and, and, and have backlit, backlight lighting. Is, is something that I probably stole from seeing Passengers, which has lots of that, mm -hmm. like, you know, walls with paneling, with, with, with decoupage, with some, you know, cut, cut out parts and everything. And I really like what uh, David Gaucher created here, uh, the art director uh, for the back of the, uh, of the airplane. Uh, it was, it's a lens that, that diffuses, but you can see that this the fuselage you know tapes in a little bit it it, it goes in at the back there and right. of course the color palette with the uh, 
with the astronauts that they save at the beginning was great. Right, uh, Hans is limiting us to another 15 minutes or so, uh, but uh, let's carry on a little bit. I'm going to, um, hey Hans. I, I, like, I like the X, we did the X behind the seat mm -hmm. so that they wouldn't turn, okay. Yes. What Hans, I go? can't see the comments from uh, uh, people. Uh, I wonder if you can just text me the question. There's some question that we want to finish with. And uh, I'm just going to ask Hans to text it to me because for some reason I can't see the people's comments. Yeah. By the way, the video walls are now like a common thing in, in movies so that mm -hmm. when the actors are, are, are facing this, first of all, the light effect uh, reflects on their faces, mm -hmm. but also uh, they see where they're supposed to be. Right. In this case, they're in space. So it was very, I mean, it's like, it's a uh, uh, Mandalorian has been shot like this now mm -hmm. and it's become like, it's the new trend. And I think that it's going to be really, really, really uh, useful. Yeah. Especially in sort of the COVID times we're living in, I think that's going to start to happen a lot more. Uh, one yeah. of the things that really impressed me about both this one and the Stark jet were the graphics that uh, were in the panels. Uh, yeah. I thought they were really absolutely beautiful and very convincingly done. Was there, yeah. Can you talk a little bit about that, please? Yeah, sure. I mean, first of all, they're, they're totally different one to another. The Starjet is far more modern and digital and everything. Mm -hmm. And the X-Jet is more common uh, uh, air, air, air devices. I did fly Cessna, so I knew a little bit about what, what you have to see on a dashboard. And of course, we had consultants to help us. But it's a... It's a fun, it's a fun thing to create because you know you can do whatever you want, but on the other end, it has to make sense for anybody who knows what flying is about. Mm -hmm. And this is this is, you know, it's like it's 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 two different uses again. You know, it's like it's uh, two different vehicles, but on two films back to back. And it's funny because like, I think that every script I've received so far until since since Spider Man, they all have aircrafts in them. So it's like, oh my God. <laughs> You're not a jet specialist, basically. Yeah. So, but you see that this is just an insert piece of the, of the extra that we had. It was a gunnery bay that we had to create, but it's like, you know, the, the, the paneling at the top and everything, it's really intricate and it's nice and it works really well, you know. Mm -hmm. Fabulous. Hey, uh, so we're gonna finish off with one more question. And basically uh, it uh, is talking finish about off. whether you had a mentor and <laughs> how you see the possibility of bequeathing all of your precious knowledge to future generations of designers. Oh my God. <laughs> yes, I did have many mentors actually. I, I, I had like, a, I worked with the best in the world. I mean, I, I've, you know, one thing that I did, first of all, I think that the, the one thing that I did that really helped me move up in, 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 my, in my time is I stepped down from being a production designer on Canadian movies, Canadian content, or even American movies, because at the time it was the, it was the uh, uh, you know, miniseries and uh, movie of the week and everything, all, all that kind of movies. I designed most of them in Montreal. I was very busy at the time and everything. And I, I, I think you can appreciate my English isn't bad. So I, I was like, you know, ahead, ahead of some other designers that, that, could, that are really talented that I could I could you know good uh, do a good pitch and, and and throw some names out there and everything but I, uh, so I stepped down and I decided to start working again but as an art director for production designers from like you know uh, uh, Nigel Phelps uh, Dante Ferretti um, um, uh, my god uh, 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 Wolf Kruger, Wolf Kruger is like, I think I've done three films with Wolf. Wolf is a genius, but Wolf mm -hmm. is a, is a, is a, is a monster also. So you have to wrangle Wolf, you have to, you know, and, uh, and Tony Pratt, Tony Pratt is the most gentle man, talented, like crazy. Uh, and, 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 you know, I, I've worked with tons of people and I've learned the process of making a movie look great. And I think that you have to believe that you can do it, that you can achieve it. You know, you have to believe that you are, you are as good as, as anybody, you know, it's like, it's, you just have to believe that you can deliver, you know? So I, I, I think that, yes, I absolutely, I want to do mentoring. I want to do conferences. I want to do, 
as much, I want to help people as much as I can to, to actually learn the process. But I mean, it all starts by yourself, by your own will and your own confidence in your own, your own self, you know? Amazing. I think that's great advice to end off with. So thank you very much. This has been an amazing treat. Seeing all your work has been very inspiring. So thank you for joining us. Amazing. Hey, thank you so much. Thank you, Hans. Thank you, Arv. Thank you, BBC Ontario. Thank you. <laughs> happy, happy Canada Day uh, yesterday. Uh, by the way, I've worked all over the place in Canada, and it's, it's just the, the best place to be, honestly. Well, what a, what a fantastic way to end the day after Canada Day. Thank you, Claude. Uh, absolutely amazing. Great to have you with us uh, again uh, and our uh, amazing job working your way through that incredible work. Uh, thank you so much for that generous and candid and inspiring conversation. Fantastic. Bravo. Thank you. Thank you. Please, thank you join us, uh, please join us next week. On Tuesday, we have our masterclass featuring Emmy-nominated DGC director, writer, and producer of The Killing, Vina Sood, moderated by the screenwriter of Crazy Rich Asians, Adele Lim. And on Thursday, Emmy-nominated DGC director and producer, Kari Skogland, in conversation with BAFTA-winning DGC director, Warren P. Sonoda. Uh, it continues to be a great ride, and we hope it's providing some relief entertainment, inspiration in these incredibly challenging times. Be safe, be well, and have a great night. Thank you so much for spending this time with us. Bye-bye.